So hi, everyone. Um, we're the Frictionless AR team, and we're going to show you a bit about what we've been working on this summer. Um, first, we'd like to thank our stakeholders at the Nasher and our sponsors over at Adobe. Also, a huge thank you to our team leaders, Ali, our project manager, and Dave and Mark, our project leads. So now I'll just introduce you to our team. I'm Abigail, and I had the pleasure of working alongside Amy, Elena, Jerry, and Lee Hong this summer. And in this presentation, we'll go over everything we've been working on this summer, starting with our work in Houdini, creating our pipeline, which we'll talk about, texturing using substance, and finally our web development with Babylon JS. We'll get to all questions at the end, but feel free to send any in the chat as the presentation goes along. All right, so first I'd like to give you an introduction to our project and what exactly is frictionless AR? So in recent years, it's been uh, a lot more popular within museums to have interactive exhibits, whether they be AR or VR, uh, having online exhibits or having things within the museums that the visitors can directly interact with. And a lot of museums are interested in doing these sorts of things because obviously it's a great experience for both them and the visitors, but they're running into a lot of issues when getting started. Like before we even get to the whole AR VR thing, one of the issues they're running into is that we can't even get the artifacts into a 3D space to begin with. Uh, currently in the industry, we, um, we use Houdini, which is a 3D modeling software, but it's also extremely complex, complex and difficult to learn. So with this in mind, we had three goals when uh, moving forward with our project. So the first was that we would automate a pipeline for digital model creation. So when you uh, first scan an artifact, whether it be through CT scan or photogrammetry, it usually ends up being very, very high resolution and difficult to use in an online render engine. So with that in mind, we want to create a toolkit or a plugin that would help these uh, museum curators to just directly have a low resolution mesh that they can use within these engines. And then the second was that we wanted to integrate different methods of model manipulation. So this basically boils down to being able to color the model, being able to give it different textures and manipulate it in a viewer. And then finally, for our third and our stretch goal was to be able to create an interactive digital end user experience. And this was done using WebXR and Babylon JS. All right. So the main program that we use to uh, create models is called Houdini. And I will just briefly introduce what Houdini is. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we can see that this is a typical view of what your work will look like in Houdini. Uh, while it does look a bit daunting, it's really not that complicated. So on the left-hand side, uh, we see kind of uh, the viewport. And this uh, shows that Houdini is you know, additional modeling and animation software. And also it, it is a visual programming software in the sense that what you code is what you see. And on the left, I'm sorry, on the right-hand side is the actual coding. So Houdini has Python and VEX support and VEX is a C-like programming language and that allows you to manipulate the geometry using code. Uh, but otherwise uh, all your work can be stored in nodes and this node-based workflow allows uh, us to easily see how information is being processed and how uh, geometries are being manipulated. And uh, what's also good about the nodes in Houdini is that all the nodes can be combined into a bigger node uh, called a Houdini digital asset. And this Houdini digital asset defines the flow of data. And this is kind of how we're creating our uh, pipeline to uh, render high-res uh, models. Uh, so here are also some examples of what we can do in nodes uh, with uh, nodes in Houdini. So the first one is a donut that we made uh, procedurally using nodes. Uh, the second example uh, is a uh, Houdini digital asset where we are able to input models of, let's say, toys in this case, and then transform them into something that looks like Lego blocks. Uh, and the third example uh, shows off how powerful VEX and Python coding is in Houdini, where we're able to simulate magnetic fields since their defining equations are well known in math. So using Houdini, we created a pipeline for the purposes of processing high resolution 3D models with much more ease and simplicity. So keeping the pipeline limited to within Houdini rather than jumping around multiple softwares. So within our pipeline, museums will scan objects or artifacts that they want to make into a 3D model through a process called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is basically taking 
hundreds of photos and compiling them to make a high resolution 3D model. However, being uh, of high resolution, it's difficult for users to be able to quickly load in a huge file on their mobile devices. So with the Houdini pipeline we developed, we have a way to optimize the resolution of the model so that it becomes lower resolution while retaining the quality of the original model. Then we segment the model into its individual components to allow for texturing and annotations that interactive exhibits may call for. Uh, then using these groupings, we create UDEM tiles for each group that we create, which are tiles composed of UVs. So UVs are essentially unwrapping the 3D model onto a 2D plane. So allowing us to put textures onto surfaces by deciding how 2D images are projected onto a 3D object. Then um, within this pipeline, we allow for texturing the model by applying a variety of different materials. So we're making our pipeline in the form of several HDAs in order to simplify the process of creating 3D models ready for interactives in Houdini. As seen on the left, there are many nodes that go into the creation of a single functionality of um, our pipeline. So this can be really tedious for someone who doesn't know how to use Houdini. So we made these networks into separate Houdini digital assets as seen on the right. So that the user only has to interact with one interface for each functionality to control the outcome of the model they're processing. So in the end, our pipeline really has only really has the user interact with a maximum of about seven nodes compared to the many more they would have to if we didn't create digital assets for each function. So next, we kind of just like to walk you through what this process looks like visually with our test subject, which is a garden node. So on the left, we have our original object. And then on the right is a high resolution 3D model that was made using photogrammetry. And we've now uploaded that into Houdini. So when you're starting out with your high resolution mesh, it's really, really large. As you can see, it's about 2 million polygons, which is obviously going to be very difficult to render in anything that's not a PC. So the first step we need to take is called voxelization. And it's essentially just pixelizing the image, but in 3D. So if you're familiar with the game Minecraft, it's like if we built the entire gnome out of blocks in Minecraft. So this lets us prepare for the next step, which is polygon reduction. So this process is all automated and we've knocked it down to about 5,000 polygons. So this is a very reasonable amount. And as you can see, we still retain the shape and most of the details on the gnome. And then the final step is just to kind of smooth out the model and make it look a little more presentable for the next few steps. In the segmentation component of our pipeline, we allow the user to manually paint custom groups over the model. So in this example, the hat and the beard of the gnome are grouped separately. So you may want to texture the hat to be something different from the beard on this gnome. So our digital asset within our pipeline allows us to create these groups much more easily than if you see on the top right, um, you have to create separate nodes for each group you want and um, kind of compress that into one single interface where it's uh, much more simpler and easier to use. So as the next step in our pipeline, we texturized and painted our gnomes. And at first we used textures and materials that were built in Houdini, um, but we soon discovered that exporting our model and texturing it instead using Substance Painter gave us many more possibilities to realistically texturize our model and also just gave us more artistic freedom, um, which we'll show you in a bit. Um, but now we'd like to show you a quick video demo of our HDA. Sorry, it's not loading. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, come on. Sorry, can you guys hear the audio? Okay. All right, 
So the first node in our pipeline is the import file node. And basically what you can do is you can choose your high resolution FBX files to load in. We've already preloaded in our GNOME, which if you can look in the bottom right hand corner of the scene view is about 2 million polygons. So obviously that's a very large model. And so our next step is to go to the mesh optimization node and knock that down a bit. So this pipeline is mostly automated. Um, everything's preset, but you can also fiddle with the resolution and the number of polygons to keep and also the iterations. So we think this looks good. This one is about 5,000 polygons. Now that our model has been reduced, we can begin to segment it. So first thing we can create a group and we're going to grab the gnome's mustache, for example. Mustache. And so we recommend that you actually use the brush pool, the brush picking tool when it comes to this because it's a lot easier. Well, then we'll click on the arrow and now we can just select the group that we want to and that's his mustache. And we press enter and it's done. So normally you'd group the entire model, but we've only grouped his mustache. And then we bake the model to prepare it for textures. Then the final uh, step is to apply the textures. So we'll create a new material group and then we'll select the group, which is the mustache that we want to be applying this material to. And then here in the material section, we will open up the network and we're gonna give him a cloth mustache. So now our node has a mustache made out of jeans. And that's pretty much the entire pipeline. On um, the end, you can choose how you want to export your file as an FBX or a GLB, save to your disk, and now you can use your model in several different render engines. So now we just want to show you um, a bit about how we textured using Substance. Um, in Substance, we assign textures to individual UDEM tiles, um, which get created based upon the groups created in Houdini and then imported into Substance. And in the bottom right hand corner, that like grid like picture is all those UDEM tiles being laid out um, with different groups, um, like the mustache, the beard, etc. So as you can see here, using these UDEM tiles, I was able to texturize each part of the gnome individually. Um, went a little crazy with the textures, wanted to show you guys just how endless the possibilities are using substance. Um, but you can see the gnome has a glitter hat, some fancy shoes, um, and these are all textures located in the substance library. And uh, additionally, if there's a specific texture you want that Substance doesn't have, you can use Substance Sampler to create it. You can see here um, on the right is a tapestry at the Nasher that we, we visited the Nasher a few weeks ago and took high resolution photos of. And then we were able to turn it into material and then apply it to the gnome's hat, as you can see, which was just so cool. And in addition to Substance Sampler, there's also uh, other Substance programs, for example, Substance Designer, where if, you know, uh, if you're not satisfied with picking your material or using the library, you can procedurally generate uh, materials from a node-based network, just like in Houdini. Uh, and here's an example here. Uh, also, on the next slide, we can see that uh, we don't really also, we don't really have to texture our things in Substance because we can also actually bring Substance materials into Houdini. Uh, the process is a little bit complicated since we need to extract the uh, different aspects of the material out. However, we create a template that allows uh, the process to be more smooth and easy, uh, easily done. So the final stage of our pipeline is for us to create a web-based platform for our end users to visualize and interact with our process models for museum artifacts in 3D space. Um, using Babylon.js, um, we can take our textured 3D model from the aforementioned steps. We can load that into our viewer and where the segmentations are preserved alongside their default materials. And our interface actually can allow our users to not only view the model, but also to interact with the model by either changing the color of the um, existing materials or even swapping out the, the original material with a new material from our material library, which consists of uh, materials exported from the Adobe Substance Suite. So basically, um, we can sort of load in any 3D object and sort of experiment with changing the looks of it in a variety of ways. And on the left here, you can see is a loaded garden gnome. And you can see that all the different segments, the hat, the beard, all the parts are kept alongside with their textures. 
And now we have a demonstration of how you can change the color as well as the material of different parts of the gnome. In this demo, we're going to show how users of our program are able to view and interact with our 3D models using the WebXR viewer. By simply clicking on parts of our model, for example, if I click on the hat of the gnome, we're able to um, change the color as well as the material of that part. And we're also able to change the color of our newly set material as well. And we can repeat this process to all parts of the gnome as well. For example, we can also change the color of the beard of the gnome to, for example, a green color. And this viewer also allows our users to view this newly textured model in 3D space. And this is our 3D model viewer for now. So using our Houdini pipeline and experiences in developing interactives in WebXR, there are a lot of different paths we can take with the work we've done this summer. So WebXR, we've only really scratched the surface of what we can do in terms of creating interactive exhibits and exhibit um, experiences in museums. So our toolkit that we've developed will provide us a strong foundation to be able to develop these interactives much more quickly. In the near future, we will be developing our WebXR viewer to work in conjunction with the VA, um, VR, AR headsets, as well as looking at the workflow between Houdini and the Unreal Engine. So we hope to create fun and interactive exhibits for the National Museum to enhance visitor experiences. So thank you so much for letting us share our project with you. And we'd now love to take any questions. Very impressive. Yeah, Very when can when can I use this? <laughs> no, I'm I'm serious. When can I use this? <laughs> You're serious. I am oh, serious. We're hoping to um to have this available for museums like the Nasher to implement interactive exhibits. So I guess the better answer would be when the Nasher opens and we can put this something like this in the Nasher. Fantastic. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't wanna talk over somebody, but my, my quick question is when you get, when are we going to look at this in AR? Uh, what's the, what's your, thoughts about how that would go forward. Uh, so I'd say that at first, we weren't really sure how much progress we'd make in the initial 10 weeks. And like the whole VR, AR thing was more of like a stretch goal that we were just kind of pleasantly surprised that we actually made it that far. So while we actually haven't um, uh, worked with like the AR, VR headsets just yet. We're hoping that as this project continues in the fall, we'll be able to explore those options more. And I know that uh, Dave actually brought in a couple headsets for us to look at, but none of us are brave enough to try it just yet. We're always afraid that we're gonna break the technology or something. But hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to look more into um, using this technology in a more interactive way. Since most of the stuff that we've done this summer was just kind of laying the groundwork for our toolkit. It's great. I hope you guys are looking at the chat. There's a lot of complimentary comments for you all. And I would love to hear from um, from Mark, your thoughts on on the outcomes of, of your Code Plus team. Well, I, I, I'm it was a great, uh, great experience working with these students. Uh, they're, they're, they're modest in, in that they far exceeded um, the steps I thought we would get through this summer. And so they really, uh, I think, pulled together uh, a wide range of technologies and, and uh, generated enough uh, working mastery of those to, to pull off some, some working prototypes at the end of the semester. And so this is really a wide, a wide skill set. Um, and uh, you know, I, a part of that I think is enabled by the way in which the students could move between uh, 
code in its traditional sense, the visual coding interface uh, is a way to kind of open that up. And I'd, I look forward to hearing more from the students as they proceed, whether, whether or not this paradigm is a useful one for bridging kind of creative work and, and, and technical work. Also, there, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, I just wanted to address one of them being, it, would, it, would interactive exhibitions be used in conjunction with exhibitions curated by curators? And I feel like that's exactly what, what we're hoping they'd be used for. Um, so, and then the next comment was talking about bringing kids to the museum to digitally paint work. So for example, we looked at some artifacts. Of course, our gnome is very cute, but it's from Walmart. So we looked at some artifacts um, from the Nasher and hopefully in the future, you know, if they have an exhibit of, you know, there's a Pacha model that we looked 